Welcome to Green and Red, Scrappy Politics for Scrappy People, a regular podcast on radical environmental and anti capitalist politics. Brought to you by Bob Bazanka and Scott Parkin. Welcome to the Silky Smooth Sounds of the Green and Red Podcast. I'm your co host, Scott Parkin, in Berkeley, California today. And as always, I am joined by. That's Bob Bazenko in Houston, Texas, and I have with me a, a little a dram, more than a dram of scotch, which I will sip on as we talk to celebrate the demise of, is he the worst person in the world? He's up there. He's up there. He's I up mean, there. He's in the running. He's in the running. He, or he was. He's no longer is. He's no longer in the running. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, to to HK, farewell. HK, we're 100 years too late. As they say, we have a little bit of a program that we're going to get into, but includes a, a conversation about the about the former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, one of the one of the longest lasting, most evil members of the foreign policy establishment, and many other things. But before we get into that, we should do our this week in radical history, and just going back about a week, the first two that I'll throw out happened on November thirtieth. One was on November 30th, 1936. Actually, a person who could be seen as a foil to Henry Kissinger was born, and that was Abby Hoffman. Abby actually is a, I would guess that he is a hero to both of us. He is the founder of the Yippies, the Youth International Party, but he was a longtime civil rights activist and direct action organizer, anti war organizer, anarchist, anarcho socialist, anarcho humorous clown type abby it's actually good to bring up abby on the same episode as we're talking about the demise of henry kissinger because if there's anyone who really embodied the spirit of the anti-war movement of a new left in the late 60s and early 70s it was abby hoffman who organized until the day he died he was doing central america solidarity actions right before he had he sadly committed suicide here's, and then here's the abby Hoffman. Here's Hoffman. A, here's I, a, um, I wanted to name kelsey Abby Hoffman Bazanko and his mom would go for it. But I think he lived his life in a way that Abby would have admired. Yeah. Oh, yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. And and if I remember correctly, there's the sort of Hollywood film about Abby Hoffman's life called Steal This Movie. And Kelsey was a big fan of that, if I remember Kelsey correctly. Kelsey watched that at least a dozen, maybe two dozen times. I can't tell you how many times I walk in and leave that on. Yeah. Either that or Strange Love or Office Space, which was probably actually his favorite. Yeah. All, all good biting critiques of yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, the yeah, world we live in. But to, to, to Abbott, was it Abbott Israel Hoffman or Abbott Abraham? I think Hoffman so. Or something? I think it may have been Abbott Israel. Yeah, yeah, I think it was Abbott Israel Hoffman. Yeah. May, may his spirit live forever. Yeah. The other November 30th uh, one is the WTO shutdown 23, 24 years ago on November 30th in 1999, the World Trade Organization, the, also known as the Battle in Seattle. Uh, always like the commemorate this one. This was a, a big inspirational moment for me. This is what pushed me into organizing. Two years ago, I believe, we actually did a, a show with three of the organizers who are now part of the WTO Organizers History Project. And we recently reposted that in commemoration of N30, November 30th. Yeah, that was, that was huge. I think for a lot of people, I think a lot of people, especially your generation who are active today, We'll point back to that. Remember, we had Kevin Danaher, who was one of the organizers of Global Exchange at the time out, who said, Buzz, we're going to shut down Seattle. And I don't know how you felt, but I remember thinking, oh, sure you are, Kevin. You did it. So it was really inspirational. I, I, I'll actually say that I was not that involved in politics or not that involved yeah. in organizing. And it was those protests that happened in Seattle that week. It was, it was five days that shook the world, as uh, Jeffrey Sinclair and Alexander Coburn said. Uh, that really changed me and transformed me and pushed me into who I am today. Yeah, it was, it was an amazing experience. I remember, like, I was actually given a final exam and we had a computer screen and I put the New York Times website up and they were showing live images from Seattle, which just, wow, was staggering. I was stunned. I hadn't seen anything like that in the U.S. in quite some time. So it was, I think, the dawn of something that would become bigger. And then I think not long after that, you had, I think Hurricane Katrina was also important, waking people up. And then, of course, Occupy. Yep. Since then, it's just been a flurry of crisis. We've just lily pad crisis to one to the other. The next round of things 
is, and this is also going back to an episode we did in 2020, which is on December 2nd and December 4th, respectively, were the, what was the assassination of some nuns in El Salvador in 1980 on December 2nd, who were targeted by Salvadoran death squads, which were backed by the U.S. government, both Carter and Reagan. And so that happened. It was four nuns, I believe, if I remember correctly, who, who were raped and killed by Salvadoran military. And then on December 4th, 1969, was the assassination by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Chicago police of Fred Hampton, who was noted, he was the head of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panthers. And he was a, he was 21 years old and he was this sort of powerful up and coming <laughs> organizer and leader in the movement robbed of his life because he made too much of an impact. There's a lot of stuff out there right now about Fred Hampton because that just happened yesterday. And, and I also want to say that our episode back in 2020 was really framed around state violence, both at home and abroad. And then we have an episode that we'll be premiering later this week with a, another victim of U.S. state violence, Brandon Lee, who's a Chinese American who was actually living in the Philippines, organizing with indigenous communities and had an assassination attempt on him by the Duterte government, which is also a U.S. backed regime, was a U.S. backed regime. Now there's a different U.S. backed regime. But Brandon was actually shot four times and actually left a quadriplegic after that assassination attempt. And then December on 3rd, 1984, yeah. on December 3rd, 1984, was the Bhopal disaster, which was in India, where uh, Dow Chemical basically spilled, had a, an industrial accident, uh, which left over, I think something like 20,000 people were actually killed in the yeah. accident. There's actually been a lot of campaigns for many years campaigns for many years trying to get justice for the people of Bhopal because not only were 20,000 people killed but there's been a lot of after effects too and I think Bhopal was pretty uninhabitable for a while as well interesting another tie-in with one of the main people we'll be talking about today Henry Kissinger and Associates actually played a pretty big role in Dow actually getting the licenses and things like that for Bhopal to actually build that chemical plant in the 1970s in India, and then also help them do spin and damage control when the accident actually happened. Also on December 3rd in 1964, when a, another day that means a great deal to both you and I, was the anniversary of the massive protest, the, the main protest during the free speech movement actions in Berkeley. This had been going on for some time. But on December 3rd, it finally cracked major sit-ins. The police came in, people were arrested. And that's been, in many ways, the height of the, the free speech movement. What I think is really important is something that happened a day before that, on, on December 2nd. Um, that was the, the famous oratory of Mario Savio, who's somebody who means a great deal to, to me and I'm sure to you and to a lot of other people who study this kind of stuff or who've take, chosen this path in life. Savio was a working-class Italian kid from Pittsburgh, so I could identify with that way too. And during the free speech movement, during these protests, it, it started with the university trying to crack down on kind of political activism on campus, right, in front of Spool Hall, and it elevated into a lot of other things. And Savio really was one of the uh, representatives of the grad students who were going out on strike against the university for all kinds of things. But he gave a, a, a brilliant speech that day, which I think is really last. And I just want to, the kind of main part of it, I think is, is really important here. Savio was talking about just, and one of the main themes, which I think is really important is Savio like to talk a lot about liberals and the, the people who are running the country and the university. And so he says at one, during the speech, he talks about liberals and the university administration. He says, and that brings me to the second mode of civil disobedience. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels and upon the levers and upon all the apparatus. And you've got to make it stop. You've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. And, and that is, I think, one of the more important and, and profound observations in, in the nature of American activism in that entire generation. Savio's words, I think, really were stirring. This is before Instagram and Twitter, so people couldn't find out about it. There wasn't like a stream of it. Uh, and so as people found out about it on campus newspapers or through 
and just word of mouth and through groups like SDS, it, it became really important. That kind of general idea that we have an obligation to throw our bodies down and, and make sure that this stops. And so Mario Savio, um, 59 years ago, uh, December 2nd, really vital and important legacy he's left us. So lot, lots of good stuff going on this week in radical history. Yep. And, and now we can speak with great glee about the demise of Henry Kissinger. Now that uh, now that Kissinger's dead, Joe Biden is the the uh, most uh, more <laughs> comatose guy in D.C., the most half-dead guy in D.C. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kiss, Kiss, Kissinger's gone now is Biden, right? <laughs> Just to kick it off on, on Kissinger a little bit, he died last week on November 29th from the New York Times obituary. He they, The headline was the most powerful secretary of state of the post-war era. He was both celebrated and reviled. His complicated legacy still resonates in relations with China, Russia, and the Middle East. He advised 12 presidents from Kennedy through Biden, but he's also, and this is where he's reviled for and which we'll never forget, Responsible for millions of deaths from Cambodia to Vietnam, he greenlit Pakistan's attack on Bangladesh, played roles in coups in Chile and Argentina, greenlit Indonesia's invasion and genocide in East Timor, and much more. We've recently, with this, just this year, we did a show on the 50th anniversary of the end of the Vietnam War, which actually Kissinger played a pretty big role in, and not the things that he did to win the Nobel Peace Prize, which is the <laughs> death of irony, if you ask us, uh, but how he, they did bombing and played up the madman theory to basically get the North Vietnamese to the table and cost a lot of lives um, where a lot of unnecessary death. And then we also just in September did an episode on the 50th anniversary of the coup in Chile on September 11th, 1973, where we talked with uh, Dr. Rodrigo Acuna and, and Dr. Clinton Fernandez about, about everything that went and played there. And then Bob and I were talking about this before, folks, and there's not a lot that we can say that's not being said and repeated over and over by a lot of people who, quite frankly, just read about him on Wikipedia like a week or two ago. Yeah. And so we're, we won't, we're not going to go on too much in our celebration of the death of Henry Kissinger. There's a couple points that we want to make, but there are some important things to remember as well. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's an expert on Kissinger this week. Uh, it's one of the issues that I think we've talked about before where everybody who has access to Google is now an expert. Yeah. There's not a lot we could say, even though I think I've been studying the guy my whole life. Kissinger was a professor at Harvard who wanted to be like the Kennedy Harvard people, right? He wanted to be like that, right? Because remember Kennedy had gone into Harvard to like got George Bundy had been a dean and folks like that who became part of his brains trust. And, and Kissinger actually was trying to ingratiate himself with the Camelot crowd and didn't really do that. But in 1968, he became very well known by offering his services to Nixon. And, 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 a, and an episode that I think is fairly well known, I'm not sure how much people know about Kissinger's role in this, but in the late stages of the election in October of 1968, Nixon had been ahead the whole time, but it was narrowing a little bit. And Humphrey kind of needed a Hail Mary. Lyndon Johnson finally, after a great deal of urging, offered a, a bombing halt for to the war in Vietnam to try to find some kind of begin peace talks or something like that. And so what Nixon's people did, and they were working through Claire Chennault, not Claire Chennault, Anna Chennault, who was the widow of Claire Chennault, who had been the director of the Flying Tigers and was still connected to politicians throughout Asia. So Anna Chennault and this dude from Harvard, this professor from Harvard, Henry Kissinger, made overtures, and I believe Kissinger actually went to Saigon to talk to Tu, who was at the time the president of Vietnam. And essentially, they sent a, a message from Nixon to, and Kissinger, Kissinger delivered the message from uh, Nixon to Nguyen Van Tu and others, which basically said, if you scuttle Johnson's peace proposal, if you make him look foolish, and make him look incompetent, then we'll take care of you. You'll get a much better deal with us. And then just after that, Nguyen Van Tu came out and publicly uh, excoriated the Johnson Peace proposal, said there's no way we're going to do that. And it killed whatever momentum Humphrey might have had. Democrats insist he would have won the election. I actually don't think that's the case. But at any rate, it was the first of the October surprises, right? There could have been one in 1980 as well. And these things are actually quite common. Maybe the original October surprise. It could have been, yeah, but there's no doubt that it happened. People even at the time knew that it happened. 
But I think that kind of tells you a lot about Kissinger and what he's willing to do, actually willing to prolong a war, which would involve, obviously, a great deal more sacrifice, a more bloodshed, a lot more people killed. But clearly, he was willing to elongate a war in order to get a position in the Nixon administration. And he became his national security advisor at first. William Rogers was the Secretary of State. And Nixon and Kissinger never really took Rogers all that seriously anyway. And then obviously Nixon appointed Kissinger Secretary of State. And I, I, if you said, and it's in everything written about him, you know, he had a, a huge role to play in Vietnam, especially in scuttling peace talks. He, again, extended that war. He was also had ties in with the Johnson administration negotiating team where he was leaking that to the Nixon campaign as well, right? Yeah, he was like, like I said, he was part of that Harvard crew, so he knew all those people. And it's the ruling class. There's a session if you have the Council on Foreign Relations and you have the Atlantic Council and all these kind of NATO intellectuals and things like that. And yeah, Kissinger was clearly part of that. And I think his role in Vietnam is really probably, it's hard to say the worst thing he did, but he scuttled peace talks, right? They had initially begun peace negotiations, actually even before Nixon became president. And there were basically agreements that could have been reached in 1969 which the U.S. rejected, which ended up being essentially the final peace proposal anyway. So Nixon did that. Nixon was one of the architects of the bombing campaigns, the famous linebacker bombing uh, runs in 1972, the Christmas bombings in, in late 1972, the, as you mentioned, the coup against Pinochet, where he famously said that they were going to make the economy scream where he also famously said that Argentina, or what was it, Chile is a dagger aimed at the uh, heart of uh, Argentina or something like that. I forget what it was. He, 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 he also said something along the lines of, we're not going to let a country com go communist because of the irresponsibility of its electorate. Yeah. yeah. He was also important in both in 1973 and the initial stages of the the October War, the Ramadan War, Yom Kippur War, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Because uh, in the initial stages, the Arab states actually had kind of caught Israel by surprise and were, were pushing it back. And and Kissinger put nuclear forces on their highest alert. The only other mm -hmm. time that it happened was during the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is another really great episode we've done, which we just recently reissued in order to decelebrate the 60th anniversary of Kennedy assassination and all the gibberish out there. I can't do a show without getting some digs at it about that. <laughs> uh, it's just there. But uh, yeah. Kissinger uh, was part of that too. And he filled up all these C-5 cargoes with military equipment and, and sent it over to Israel. And that's really when the U.S.-Israel defense relationship really was consummated, even more than in 1967, was in 1973. And from that point on, we know what's happened right today. Henry Kissinger, yeah, he was, I think, but there are two kind of people who've done diplomacy in the 20th century in the U.S. There, there are two who stand out, and Kissinger for worse, is one. And the other is somebody we actually did a show about earlier this year, who would be George Frost Cannon. Right. And I think there are two different ways. They're both imperialists, right? But as we said to our friend, Frank Castigliola, who wrote the book on Kissinger, on Cannon, I'm sorry. Cannon is like the left's favorite imperialist because Cannon was pensive. He was introspective. He could be self-critical. And he later came around and renounced, actually, some of the positions he'd taken, some of the things he did. Whereas Kissinger, I've seen in some of these, especially in some of these panegyrics, these tributes to him, which are really awful. Many of them are so awful. When they say Kissinger was a realist or Kissinger was an idealist, and they try to put him within this framework. And the fact is the guy operated based on the ideas of power. Was he really different than John Foster Dulles? Or was he really different than uh, Dean Acheson? Or was he really different than Dean Rusk, who kind of was a big proponent of the Vietnam War? We do like to talk a lot about how evil he was, and we have all the memes about him greeting Satan, you know, and probably Kissinger's taken over already, right? He's probably ordered several bombing runs of the last circle of hell or something like that. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, he is clearly different than, than Kennedy. But the last thing I'll say on this, because there's so much we could talk about, but I did find it like discomforting in early 2022 when the war against Ukraine broke out. And that can serve as a segue because we're going to talk about this in a few minutes too. One of the reasons behind the war, which I'll still argue today, was the expansion of NATO. And two of the people who, people like me and you on the left, were invoking to point that out and say, hey, NATO expansion is really important to understand within this context. But two of the people who had pointed that out much earlier, warned against it, were George Frost Kennedy and Henry Kissinger. 
Right. And so I found myself mumbling. And Kissinger said that too, because yeah. Cannon and McNamara actually. But Kissinger understood that. He actually just, what, a few months ago, went to China. The Chinese had invited him. And that says a lot about Biden, doesn't it? When one of the biggest war criminals and greatest violators of human rights ever, Henry Kissinger, is the voice of reason on China and Taiwan over, over Biden, right? Right. Which is really scary because the, the current group we have in power, and Blinken is one of his protégés too. Blinken went to that famous birthday he had at the New York Public Library a few months ago. And yeah, Kissinger was really foul and vile. Just one of the things I want to point out is that in the in, in the obituaries and articles that you're seeing that revile him, some point this out in some tone, he's almost portrayed as this sort of like genocidal maniac and a, as, as a, a bit of an outlier from the foreign policy establishment and the liberal order and things like that. But Kissinger was the architect of that. And a number of people who were foreign policy experts and policymakers for Bill Clinton, for Obama, for Biden, were protégés of Henry Kissinger, including Anthony Blinken, today's Secretary of State, and Hillary Clinton, who was Obama's oh, yeah. Secretary of State. And Kissinger and Clinton belonged to the same coven in Manhattan. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But they had pizza there, right? Um, yeah. And, and the blood of, of war victims. Yeah. Clint, Hillary Clinton actually reviewed um, a book by, by Kissinger in 2014 and called him a friend. She also <laughs> said that she relied upon his counsel when she was Secretary of State. And this was, she was Secretary of State that bombed Libya and helped overthrow Gaddafi. She said in that review that quote, a conviction that we and President Obama share a belief in the indispensability of continued American leadership in service of a just and liberal order, right? And that's the thing is that this foreign policy establishment is rooted in this just and liberal order. They actually, maybe Trump was a little bit of an outlier to it, and they pushed back on that. Some of what was going on, I also think that Trump helped maintain it, even though he was trying to dismantle it. Kissinger actually said, talked about Hillary Clinton when he thought she was going to end up be, being president. That she ran the State Department in the most effective way I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just, there's, and, and, and Kissinger also liked to compare his, some of the policy he made, policies he made around the bombing of Vietnam and the bombing of Cambodia when they weren't respecting national sovereignty to Obama's drone war in Pakistan and in the tribal areas of Afghanistan and, and Pakistan. And, you know, spent a lot of time, you know, as a closet advisor to these democratic administrations to the point, I'm sure that he was advising Biden on China, which is part of why he probably yeah, got to China, well, went to China. So I just want to, I just want to point out that the point here is that Hen Henry Kissinger was not an outlier. He was the embodiment of what this establishment is. Yeah. You and I have also done the, the whole Kissinger's the worst guy in the world kind of stuff, but the reality is you're right. Like Kissinger is the American diplomat, right? Kennan is actually far more of an outlier than Kissinger is, because exactly. Kennan actually is like, started to think about, hey, is this a good idea? Have we done the right thing? But Kennan and Kissinger both are really consumed with ideas of power and the projection of American power. But I think Kennan also understood it in a, in a kind of more uh, a global scale. Because we're talking like in the 90s, 80s and 90s, we'll talk about global warming as, as, a, as a growing crisis, right? I never heard Kissinger talk about stuff like that, but they did both have this kind of belief in a, in a powerful world order. But I think Kennan became, over time, far more reluctant to assert American power, whereas that was Kissinger's go-to, right? And, and obviously Hillary Clinton. Pretty much everybody, when, what's her name? Now, Madeleine Albright issued that famous statement, remember, that on, on 60 Minutes when Leslie Stahl said 500,000 Iraqis, including a lot of children, are dead through the sanctions. And she said, Albright said, that's a terrible, terrible, but you know, we think it's worth the cost. And that was Henry Kissinger talking, right? That was Kissinger talking to Kissinger. Part of it is because he was a Republican and perceived as a Republican and Democrats hated him. So mm -hmm. that became a big part of it. And the media outrage became a big part of it. And he was, he, I can't say anything good about the guy. And there's, you know, the anti-war movement hated Kissinger with yeah. great reason. Yeah. And then that gets conflated with elements in the Democratic Party. So therefore they see him as at least publicly, he's seen as an adversary, but he was as interested in working with the, those Democratic administrations as he was yeah. with Reagan and Bush yeah. Jr. And even Trump. I, mean, I would, I think JFK is every bit as, as demonic and diabolical as, as Henry Kissinger is, right? John yes. Foster Dulles, 
there's a lot. McNamara is a, a, a shady character. So there are a lot of them, but Albright, Hillary Clinton, for Christ's sake, Gaddafi, Coup in Honduras, blank checks to, to Israel, Haiti. There's so much we could say. NATO, obviously, about the Clintons there. The Clintons and Obama are... This, this is one issue, especially when you come to issues like empire, where there's really not difference, no differences, meaningful differences between the Democrats and Republicans. And in fact, we're in this bizarre world right now. We're going to talk about this in a few minutes with regard to Ukraine. But the peace, the peace faction is actually the crazy far right nowadays, right? You yeah. have these like insane people who are actually not on Gaza, not Gaza but on Ukraine, you have people like Gates and others who have been like actually critical of, of U.S. involvement there. Uh, and that's largely because of Trump, right? Just like Trump did a flip tomorrow and told him to go volunteer to fight for Ukraine. They do it because they're idiots. But at the same time, um, the bigger point is that I think Kissinger really is the platonic ideal of an American foreign policy official. There are very few. Kennan is way more of an outlier than Kissinger ever would have been. Kennan was never Secretary of State. He would have loved it. But and even in the 40s, they knew that Kennan was too smart, he was too analytical. And he wasn't as much of a believer, whereas Kissinger really believed in all the shit, or he faked it well. But I think he believed the shit he said about American power. And, but if you go, the famous Anthony Bourdain line, if you go to Cambodia, you'll never give up the, the desire to kill Henry Kissinger with your bare hands, right? But in Cambodia, everybody talks about the Khmer Rouge, which was horrific, but the Khmer Rouge was essentially enabled by that bombing campaign, which just destroyed Cambodian infrastructure and civil society and enabled the Khmer Rouge, which was a splinter, a smallish group, to come to power eventually. So Kissinger's and in, in obviously in, in Chile and it's just in so many places, he just led such a malignant, toxic legacy. Yeah. It's chilling, but not that shocking, right? Look at the world today. Look at in a world where Netanyahu and Biden exist right now, Kissinger. It's really that much. doesn't really raise your attention that much, right? Look at what's happening right now in, in Gaza. That's as, as every bit as bloody and atrocious and horrific as really anything that happened in Vietnam or Cambodia. And that's saying a lot, which is really horrifying. Yeah, the world's, I think, a, a better place without him, but it's not really going to change things all that much. He also lived to be 100, so he did everything he could do before he was gone anyway. Man, yeah, only the good die on uh, but, yeah, uh, he was at right. He was supposed to be at Rice University not that long, ago, six weeks ago, and he didn't make it. He did, I don't know if he was like obviously when you're 100 every day could be your last. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. But anyway, yeah, he was causing mischief to the bitter end. But it's ironic too because I remember when the story about him going to China came out, I actually thought, oh, that's good. Like that's how effed up Clinton, uh, Biden and Blinken are. Like when you're like happy that Kissinger is getting involved in it, right? Because he's the guy who, you know, to, and if, I don't know if you want to give credit for it, but it makes sense that Kissinger actually did end the Vietnam War and then brokered that detente between the, 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 the Soviet Union and China, which other mm -hmm. Republicans turned on, right? So by the mid-70s, you have the Committee on the Present Danger and you have Jerry Ford flipping on the, the CIA report and going to Team B, even a lot of those people flipped on the Kissinger, Kissinger, Nixinger, they often refer to as they, like a J-Lo kind of thing. They called it Nixinger. Yeah. And they, and even they, they like, they cut SALT agreement. They recognized the People's Republic of China. They developed a one China policy, which Biden is just freaking ignoring right now. They warned against, they, they actually had this understanding that Russia was an adversary that you had to treat with respect. So Christ, here I am becoming a revisionist on Kissinger as I speak. <laughs> And Kissinger, I was reading Kiss last night that Kissinger actually was very critical of Goldwater's campaign in 64, saw him as adjacent to Nazis. I guess that's when he was advising the Rock. He was foreign policy advisor to Nelson Rockefeller's presidential yeah, campaign. Yes, yeah. And he was a foil for the, as the new right was rising in the 70s, yeah. because they didn't like the detente with the Soviets that right. they had been negotiating. But then, of course, he became a close advisor to Ronald Reagan once he was in office. Yeah. Shocking. Yeah, that's actually is one of the ironies, right? Reagan and uh, the Republican right ran against Nixon. That was their whole point. And they ran against Nixon. Nixon. Yeah, the SALT and SALT II were sellouts. And we're letting the Soviet Union take control and all this shit. Nixon. So that's why, like, in retrospect, Nixon, I actually have kind of revised. He's, they're both really horrific people, but 
the point here is that in the United States, like every, everybody who's in that position believes the same thing. Anyway, uh, Henry Kissinger, yeah. uh, don't rest in peace. I don't know what the opposite of that would be. Uh, burn, I hope you and, burn in hell. Burn in hell. You and Satan are arguing every day. You know? and, uh, and so goodbye. Goodbye, uh, Henry Kissinger. Uh, fairly well, Henry. Fairly well, all right. What I wanted to talk about just briefly, because you and I, too, for the, almost two months now, right, we've talked about virtually nothing but but Gaza and, and the, the horrors that uh, Israel is, is inflicting there, which just get worse by the day, right? And we've forgotten that there's another big war out there that, that uh, Joe Biden and Anthony Blinken kind of jumped into with both feet, too, and that's Ukraine, and that's still going on. And the media isn't, they're still reporting on it, obviously, right? But it's no, nowhere near the lead story anymore because whatever propaganda they, Israel tells them to put out that day is what we're getting in the media from the U.S. government, right? But the war is still going on. And I just wanted to say a few things about that because about 10 days ago, I believe, a story came out from the, whoever the head of Zelensky's party in Ukraine, I forget the name of the party was, but he came out and, and essentially corroborated something that you and I have talked about for quite some time, right? And that's that there actually have been attempts to broker some kind of peace agreement between Russia and Ukraine. And we first heard this in early 2022, not long after the war started, from Natalie Bennett, who's no one's idea of a dove, right? We know that China, Xi Jinping, had offered to broker peace talks in Ukraine, which the U.S. and Britain rejected. The U.S. and Britain forced the Naftali talk, Bennett talks to be scuttled. They rejected, uh, they, they made sure that Ukraine rejected peace proposals from China. I believe that there was a, a, a group of African countries which put forth a proposal for negotiations, which again, Ukraine rejected. And now what we have is the head of the servant of the people faction, who was a negotiation, who was a, a delegate at, at peace talks in 2022, said, and this is from the, the article, said that the Russian delegation promised Kiev peace in exchange for refusing to join NATO, but the Ukrainians did not believe them. So you have it here from, that's about as good a source as you get. This is somebody who's Zelensky, seen, I guess he's be the equivalent of the Speaker of the House kind of thing or something, the, the head of the, the political party in Congress, right? Mm -hmm. Saying that, yes, there were peace talks, and that NATO was a huge sticking point and that Russia had, had made an agreement, said that's as important. I said, we will make concessions if you agree not to expand NATO or not to join NATO. And that scuttled it. So once again, obviously, if that happened, anybody who believes that Zelensky is making these calls on his own is naive, right? Obviously, he's not. Zelensky is taking a great deal of, let's call it advice, right? He's obviously <laughs> taking protection from Washington and from London and from other NATO countries. Meanwhile, the war is still ongoing. It's bloody. It's brutal. The numbers are all over the place. I went and looked at them again today, but I just started with uh, civilians, right? There are estimates all over the place, but anywhere between 15 and 20,000 civilians have been killed. That's about as many as in Gaza, which is like way tinier and has only been fighting for less than two months, right? As horrible as what's 16,000 was the number I heard today on the news. Yeah, and those are virtually all civilians in, in Gaza. In, in yeah, 70, 80 percent, right? something like that. Yeah, no, 70, 80 percent are women and children, actually. Yeah. And so in, in almost two years in Ukraine, you still have way fewer than you've had in less than two months in Gaza, which just is just a way to illustrate the, the horrors and the, and the scope of what Israel is, is doing there. But you've had yeah. over about, like, I don't know, the numbers are all over. I've seen 11,000, 15,000, 17,000. But what else you have? In Ukraine, there are, and this is according to U.S. estimates, about 70,000 killed. I've seen numbers lower in the 35,000 range. I've seen numbers in the 120,000 range. Again, a lot, right? Russia obviously has suffered way more, probably 150,000 killed, which is Ukraine's estimate, which may be high. The U.K. has estimated 70,000. I believe the U.S. estimate was over 100K. The point here, and this is what we've said all along, is it's a brutal, bloody war. Now that it's been going on for nearly two years, it'll be two years in February, it's not going to end soon, right? Uh, there have been all kinds of studies. When wars begin, if wars last more than more than a year, but even a little under that, but once you get into that range where it's close to a year, then you can expect a long war. Usually short conflicts end fairly quickly, yeah. right? And once you've reached a certain point, once you're past that six months, and especially once you're getting close to a year, 
then you can expect it to go on. Even the mainstream media, the corporate media has been talking about lately how essentially there's really no movement. There's more or less a stalemate. It's brutal. It's bloody. And perhaps it is time to negotiate and figure a way out. Yeah. And, and I actually think Kissinger would probably have said that too. But anyway, I just think it's important to keep remembering that because Biden and Blinken have kind of essentially risked their entire legacy and, and clearly their, their uh, election on, on these two wars. And the American people ain't that geeked up about it. They're not that psyched about it. And uh, Gaza is obviously getting all the attention right now, <clears throat> as it should. It's horrific. But what's happening in Ukraine, which is just really horrific as well, and, and just just a bad idea and really could have been resolved. And that's where I think Kissinger and Biden meet, right? And God forbid, Kissinger was actually more reasonable than Biden and Lincoln by suggesting that NATO has a role to play in that. Whereas both Clinton and Obama, when they were president, essentially just wanted to assert American power and show Russia who boss was. And yeah. I think Kissinger actually came from a different generation, probably because the Soviet Union was still a major player, which said, no, you have to treat them like a, a war of the opponent, an adversary, but one that deserves respect. And and clearly, since that point with Clinton and Obama and Bush, you haven't seen that. And so now we're in this really horrific, sanguine situation where people are getting killed and there's no end in sight. Yeah, but there's um, where Obama called Russia a regional yeah. player. Yeah. And R Russia has many resources and many natural resources, which has built a up a wealthy upper class there. But it shows you where the, at least the foreign policy establishment, or at least the liberal foreign policy establishment is on them. And, and I just yeah. see this as an opportunity just to, I think maybe at the end of the day, I'm just a simple around this, but it's just, I think what their goal is, is they want to bleed Russia as much as possible, as well as have this like war of sanctions that they've been doing for going on two years is the mother of all sanctions, right? <laughs> Against them to just cripple them. Yeah, I... I... Yeah, I don't know. I'm sure that's it. I just, it, it, it never made sense because Russia is surrounded by 31 states who were in, a, in an enemy military alliance, right? So you have yeah. Russia and then you have 31 NATO countries yeah. all within. Kind and of growing, countries. yeah. Yeah. And so that Russia threat, if you don't want Russia involved in the Donbass, then you talk to it and you kind of cut the negotiation, which really they never attempted. And in fact, the U.S. obviously contributed to this in, in 2014. Victoria Newland and others were, were really involved, like in the Maidan coup and revolution, whatever you want to call it. So the United States clearly has its fingerprints all over this, and it, it didn't need to. It didn't need to. No. Uh, it's been a kind of a traditional ally of Israel, and this is obviously outrageous too. But it, you have in both of these places now, the United States is clearly... And the other part of this, which you're not really getting a sense of, I think, in the U.S. media, is that this is seriously damaged whatever credibility the U.S. had left in the world. The, the American media wants you to believe that everybody feels this way, but the reality is they don't. Most people don't believe that the United States should be involved in prolonging the war in Ukraine, obviously, and uh, obviously the world does not in any way condone what's happening in, in Gaza right now. So the U.S. And, and in that regard, people like Kissinger actually understood how to maintain America's place in the world. That's one of the reasons they knew that the war had to end. The United States had lost credibility to such a degree, right? Yeah. After the Christmas, well, the story of the Christmas, last thing I'll say, the story of the Christmas bombings is that the media's prolonged it. One of core historian have prolonged it too. They've said that the Christmas bombings forced Vietnam, the Northern Vietnamese, the communists, to the negotiating table where they ended the war. Reality is the Christmas bombings forced the U.S. to negotiate an end to the war. Because they had been just, they were condemned. There were like global protests. The United States, Nixon's, just this is just months after Nixon had won this overwhelming election in 1972. And his popularity was down, I think, in the 20s or low 30s because of the Christmas bombings, right? And so I think Kissinger even at that point understood, okay, we got to end this thing now. Yeah. Or, in fact, but Kissinger, and this is the last thing. In 1973, Kissinger declared that this would be the year of year life. Basically, his point was we've mucked around in Vietnam and these other places, and we've ignored our main allies in Europe. So we have to come back and refocus on that, which is something right. obviously we're not seeing today. So Kissinger, goodbye. The war in, in Russia and Ukraine, let's hope that somebody comes to his or her senses soon. And Ukraine is, I'm sorry, uh, Gaza, I, other than the cry, I don't know what to do about that. Yeah, it's terrible.
it's heartbreaking every day. And I know we want to end on a, a, a note with the passing of a, a very well-known artist. Yeah, just to wrap it up, uh, the other person who died this week, who actually died on November 30th, was uh, Shane McGowan, who was the lead co-founder, frontman, chief lyricist for the Pogues, Celtic punk band, who they do a lot of music around Irish history and Irish nationalism and the Irish diaspora in different parts of the world. McGowan actually was firmly rooted in left of center politics. His family were Irish Republicans to the point where McGowan even talked about how he regretted not joining the IRA. He said, I was ashamed I didn't have the guts to join the IRA and the Pogues were my way of overcoming that. He also suffered from a lot of addiction issues and actually got kicked out of the Pogues for a time for about 10, 10 ish years, but then was invited back in. Shane McGowan Presente, I'm going to, we're going to, we're going to exit outro with a song, but I also just want to um, say a, a few lyrics from probably my favorite Pogue song, which is called The Body of an American. Uh, Fare thee well, gone away, there's nothing left to say. With the slanty Joe and Aaron go my loves in America. The calling of the rosary, Spanish wine from far away. I'm a freeborn man of the USA. Folks, you've been listening to the Green and Red podcast. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. If you're listening to us on many one of the many audio platforms, give us a rate and a review. It helps us with the algorithms. And if you really like us, particularly since we're the end, at the end of the year, and we actually didn't really prepare anything for this today, but we actually have bought another load of certain days calendars, which will be given out to some of our bigger donors to help with our end of year's fundraising. But in the meantime, feel free to go to greenredpodcast.org and hit that support button or become a patron at patreon.com backslash greenredpodcast. Bob, it's been fun. Kissinger, I hope he's getting his just reward in the afterlife. Everyone else misbehave and cause lots of trouble. And we'll talk to you again soon. Turned and shook as we had.